Hello everyone, I'm Chessic44, also known as Fly, and welcome to this Let's Play of In Other Waters. Last episode, we went through a tangled veil of sorts, the other half of the region, and at the end we finally managed to find the ROV, which indicated there's some sort of structure we need to investigate. Which we will. First things first, we have a load of samples that need to be studied. So, let's get all of these samples analyzed. We have a lot of them. Ten of them, basically. And we have found many creatures. So, this one is probably going to be a lot of reading. Multiple taxonomy entries updated with some of this. Almost. Alright, I think that's all of them. Good. Now, we got a load of creatures here to look at. First, the Abyssal Sail Shell. This is probably going to be a lot of reading. These shale shelled creatures with their large translucent tails are surprisingly fast for animals of their kind. Occasionally spotted weaving between veils in the deep, they are the speed as a way of evading the slow moving tangles. They are also dark in color and small, making them, diff making them a difficult target for other creatures that might hunt them. They use modified back legs with wide oar-like shapes to, to both propel themselves and make rapid turns. But the most distinctive of all their features is their large translucent tail, which stands like a crest behind them. From my observations, these tails seem to be a form of propulsion for the sail shells, but until I can inspect a fragment of one, or more of one in more detail, this cannot be confirmed. Fortunately, we found one. After finding a segment from a sail shell's tail, it seems obvious that these creatures use their tails for propulsion. But rather than flapping them like a flipper, the sail shells use their tails to catch currents and allow the flow of water propel them through the deep ocean. Their tails and the rest of their shells are incredibly light, which means that even a mild flow is enough to grant them significant speed. This may also be why they follow the same paths. Their propulsion is best suited to using currents where they can find them, rather than choosing their own route. But why travel back and forth through dangerous veiled territory over and over? Perhaps a look at a full sail shell, even a larval one, could help us understand this. Seems we found one. After analyzing a clutch of beaded sail shell eggs and inspecting their anatomy, I've started to understand their behavior. Larval sail shells are already forming modified limbs with thin, thread-like wisps on them. These limbs move so fast when the sail shell is swimming that they can't be seen, but in the, do but in the dormant eggs they are clearly visible. These wisps would allow the sail shells to feed by catching small larval creatures as well as any other particles and nutrients found in the water. This must be what the sail shells are doing when they follow their carefully selected paths back and forth through the water. It is also likely that the veils attract, trap, and produce tiny particles the sail shells feed on, hence their close proximity. The result for sail shells is a very risky feeding pattern. Oh, wow. Yeah, I can see why they call them sail shells. Very interesting. Next, the cold fire fan. These tall, fan-shaped filter feeders can be found in the deep ocean of Gliese 667 CC, where they glow with a distinctive warm bioluminescence. The centerpieces of the deep ocean's oases of life, cold fire fans and their flame-like pulsing light, attract many other creatures to live around them. How this benefits the fan isn't precisely clear, but there are many possibilities, including defense and sustenance. Although the fans themselves do not lack in defenses, as unlike the smaller and paler fans which can be found in the bloom, cold fire fans have a sheddable mucus sheath which stops them becoming overgrown with other plants and creatures. Sampling and analyzing these sheaths might give some further insight into the role they play in the fans' eating habits. Which we've done. Getting hold of a cold fire fan's sheath has brought many other samples with it. The sheath itself is covered in pollen, microbiological colonies, even fecal matter. It seems that the sheath acts as a barrier for large particles, blocking them from reaching the fan's spines, where, while smaller particles pass through and are digested by the fan. 
The fan's light is then a beacon, specifically intended to bring creatures into its glow, benefiting the fan with the resulting increase in particles in the local area. The sheath stops this from becoming overwhelming for the fan, and can be shed in order to protect it. The patterns of the fan's light remain mysterious, and r remain mysterious though. Why does each individual display different pulses and waves at different times? Well, we found something to study. Analysis of the cold fire fan spine we were acquired shows that fans not only possess light producing cells, but also light receptors too. These incredibly sensitive cells are found on the front of the fan, and show the fans are able to perceive the lights of other creatures, including other fans. As each fan tends to its own oasis, perhaps the fans use their lights as territorial markers, signaling to other fans that their basalt column is taken. They may even use them to communicate with other species, responding to the flashing patterns of veils, for example, and letting them know not to approach their territory. Like lighthouses, cold fire fans seem to act as both safe havens and warning signals, depending on the creature they are signaling. Okay. So that's interesting. Picks up, allows tiny particles in to feed on, but blocks out the large ones. Interesting. Ah, uh, the snare veil. Okay, let's see here. Snare veils are unique, soft-bodied creatures that resemble a thin sheet of silk studded with lights. Found in tangles of multiple individuals. Oh, we did read some of this. Ah, uh, theories we need. Having sampled a dying veil, analysis of the tissue demonstrates what a unique creature a snail veil is. Its tissue is threaded through with powerful neuro co neural connections, lined with a digestive surface like the interior of an animal intestine, and coated with a layer of light-emitting cells. It is as if a single creature had been turned inside out and rolled out until it was a flat plane millimeters thick. A snare veil is a totally distributed form of life with no centralized brain, stomach, or other organs at all. It is self-same in its entirety. Any other piece resembles another. What we saw as a dying veil might have been purposefully separating itself, as each piece of a veil could grow another tangle. No wonder they have dominated portions of the seafloor. High density folded veil section, bioluminescent patter patterning. Okay. It, it's very interesting that they basically, they're the laziest feeders. They just lay there, flashing colors, hoping something comes close enough for it to feed on. Water bulbs. Water bulbs are pale, soft, egg-shaped creatures with transparent sections in their outer membrane. Water bulbs filter water through their interiors, which are hollow apart from a single gelatinous sphere which sits at their center. Their anatomy is so unique that it is difficult to understand exactly what these incredibly passive creatures are doing. They seem to have small, stump-like legs at their base for stability, but it is unclear if they can use them to move. Water bulbs seem to simply sit and filter water while bathing in the pale light at the edge of the fan oases. Perhaps we can understand more by analyzing the petal pollen and other particles they seem to absorb when filtering the oasis water. Which we've done. The analysis of petal pollen, which reveals them to be water bubbles with a skin of waste matter, fails to add much more to our understanding of the water bulb. It's clear that they gain nutrients, and perhaps some of the oxygen housed in their interior, from their consumption of the pollen, but unlike the glowing fans, they don't seem to be reliant on it. Instead, they display a surprising level of passivity while absorbing and filtering much of their local environment. They seem to be without predators or prey, and are ignored by many other life forms. I have noticed that some specimens have buds, small growths which suggest they are growing clones of themselves to reproduce. Perhaps by carefully sampling one of these buds, we might get a miniature picture of the water bulb's anatomy. Which we've done. Analyzing a water bulb bud has provided an important insight into their anatomy. The bulbs themselves are mostly hollow, with only a thin membrane filled with pores, separating them and the water around. The interior side of this membrane is iridescent, lined with hexagonal crystals of guanine, producing an effect like the eye sheen seen in terrestrial cats, sharks, and other creatures but on a much larger scale. These crystals reflect light into, onto the sphere at the center of the bulb, which is in fact a huge and impossibly complex compound eye. This eye can see a broad spectrum of light, including UV and IR, with at least 36 different photoreceptor types. What are these water bulbs observing, and why are they so passive? 
Just the thought of their total vision makes me nervous in their presence. So these things are just massive eyes? Kind of creepy. And just leaves me wondering what they're doing here. Alright, the deep orrery. Orreries are complex masses of polyps, tentacles, and other structures that form a web-like structure that swims as one. Unlike a terrestrial jellyfish, orreries appear to be asymmetrical with marked differences even between individuals. Many of their orbiting sections are thin, blade-like membranes, but structures that resemble strings of translucent pearls, thread-like tentacles, and bulbous polyps also make up a large part of their bodies. Each orrery has a central mass, which is protected by a series of cloud-like soft membranes, twisted around each other like a rose. Close encounters with orreries have shown them to be dangerous hunters, capable of tangling up and shocking their prey into submission. They also deploy shocks as a defensive measure when faced with larger creatures. Like me. Perhaps further study of their prey may help. Which we've done. Having analyzed some tissue from the orrery's agile prey, we can begin to understand their behavior. Unable to match other creatures for speed, orreries seem to rely on the dangers presented by deep sea veils, beside which they are often found. Veils funnel cautious creatures into the orrery's nests, while the orreries themselves don't seem to be affected by the veils and are able to traverse them easily. Perhaps the two have a symbiotic relationship, hunting together in a mutually beneficial manner? Outside of this, Orries appear to be mostly lone hunters, and I have seen no social interactions between individuals. What exactly is an orrery? I would like to understand more about their strange uneven forms. Perhaps a polyp that has been shed might provide details on their anatomy. Which we've found! Analysis of an orrery polyp has demonstrated that they are indeed colonial creatures. They appear to be made up of both specialized animals of the same species and different creatures of different species. Based on this, the orreries may need to be reclassified, although that would require extensive study and equipment I don't have access to. What I can say about the orreries is that each one seems to have specialized its own growth based on its requirements. Many of the zooids that are part of this colony are able to shift between medusoid, dactyl dactylozooid, tentaculozooids, and gastrozooid forms with incredible speed, depending on whether the colony needs to focus on propulsion, feeding, defense, or digestion. This makes each orrery a complex social and biological structure, like a floating city rather than a lone hunter. Wow. That is very complex. Jeez. And now we have cold fire bathers. Cold fire bathers are pale, thick-stalked, trifoil plants found in the deep of the S667CC's ocean. The only known specimens currently identified have all been found gathered around glowing fans, basking in their warm light. This suggests that the bathers are photosynthesizing this bioluminescence in order to live, and therefore cannot live outside of the sustaining glow of the fans. This is a knock-on effect for other life, as groupings of bathers then attract other creatures, perhaps to feed on or hide within them. The bathers also seem to produce a type of pollen, made up of small particles that float on the deep water currents. This may well be a seasonal or rare event that my visitors happen to coincide with, or a constant state. Further study of this pollen would be desirable, which we've done. Analysis of bather pollen has shown that they are released around bubbles of oxygen, a waste product of the plant's photosynthesis. These bubbles are surrounded with a layer of pollen particles which weighs them down so they do not immediately rise to the surface. Instead, these bubbles drift through the water near the bather, and in many cases settle on the nearby fan. The fans then consume these bubbles, absorbing both the oxygen and the pollen, along with anything else which reaches them. This direct exchange of energy and nutrients makes the fans and their bathers closely linked, a strong bond formed under the principle of mutual gain. And the sample we acquired of a bather root network shows the presence of bulbs within their root network. These bulbs appear to be a way of the bathers storing the energy gained from their photosynthesis of the fan's bioluminescent light. Concealed in rocky cracks and the softer, silty substrate of the seafloor, they must allow bathers to outlive fans which die off or stop producing light. This suggests that despite appearances, it is not the fans which maintain the, bather, the bathers, but the other way around. The bathers then, despite appearing like worshippers of the fans clustered around their bases, 
create the conditions for the fans to grow within, ensuring themselves a regular supply of light in exchange for oxygen. In a sense, the fans are their captives. A little bright line. All right. That's also very interesting. Either way, that seems to be all the information we have here. So the only other place to go now is to see what this structure is to the north that we need to investigate. We still have some time. Let's go and see it. Ah, thanks for the fall. Okay, well, let's head up to the north. Oh, shit, no, wait, I forgot, I forgot. I need to actually put some stuff into, uh... Into the bay, <laughs> so that I have uh, an extra source of power and oxygen if I need it, which I probably will. That's my fault. I forgot about that. Uh, let's see. Okay, now that we actually have a few things, let's uh, let's move up and see what we can find up here. There is nothing here but the silt flickering in the suit's headlamps. Some strangely geometric rocks sit in the dark. What are these formations? A lar a huge flat structure bedded into the sea floor. Could Mane have built this? What are we looking at here? It appears to be some kind of shaft cut into the bedrock. I can't see the bottom. Who made this? Looks like it's been here far longer than anything else. Hm. A yawning black shaft that descends into the sea floor. An anomaly that must be solved. Further deep we go. Deeper we go, then. Found something. This com The compartment is filled with sand and rock, which looks to have entered through the collapsed ceiling. The suit's lamps reveal two dark holes on opposite sides of the shaft, their torn edges thick with crimson rust. Can't do anything there, but can we get to this other hole? Yes. The bent entryway bulges inward like the interior corridor of some huge creature's distended body. Ah. We have something new. These pale creatures are scraping patterns into the walls. What are they? Let's see what we can find out. This almost motionless polyp with its waving cilia is anchored to the metal pl plating. Its pale flesh is drained of color. Sand drifts off in the metal room. On the far wall, strange spirals glint into the headlamps as a pale creature obsessively traces their patterns. It doesn't look like we... Well, we can try getting close, and I do see it moving along. There doesn't appear to be anything more. Okay. Let's head back. And even deeper... Deeper still. A huge round doorway sealed by a thin metal security iris, the plates of which are furred with orange rust. It's some kind of facility. What was happening down here? Why would someone bury this place so deep? We have to get inside. We can use the torch to cut through the seal. Fire it up. Fire it up. Ignite. Okay, made it in. Sand and rock fills one side of the access way. Dark holes in the walls and ceiling reveal layers of eaten away piping and ducts. 
Beyond the doorway, a vast dark space opens out in the rock, filled with skeletal remains of rusted machines. Oh dear. The water is filled with red flakes catching in the lamps. From the walls, rusticles ha hang in lumpen garlands. This place is huge. How the hell was it built down here? There's very little oxygen for the rebreather re to cycle here, so we are running on reserves. Let's move. Once a loading bay or vehicle hangar, this domed atrium is now dark and distorted. It's huge sand drifts hiding piles of oxidized metal. Above a huge shelf lurches out above a huge shelf lurches out of the curved roof of the bay. Its underside hung with globular orange spines. The eaten away frame of a vehicle lies outside the lock, the canopy twisted open and fused in place. A large open lock leads into the depths of what appears to be a corporate arcology. What secrets have been buried in this place? Both doors of the massive main lock sit open. The entire arcology must be flooded. Oh! Oh! User X Otero. Massive breach. Life support will fall fail in two hours. Is there anyone from Baikal on this channel? Please respond. The vast volume of the arcology lies ahead, piled with rock and sand, drowned in this dark ocean. The main volume of the arcology is broken up by low buildings partitioned away from the space. These offices. Those are Baikal markings. What was an exoplanet extraction core doing here? I worked for Baikal. Minet worked for Baikal. They built the suit. They built the base. They mine exoplanets, skim helium from gas giants. They help drive forward humanity's expansion. If they'd discovered life, we would have known. Everyone would have known. Unless... Something happened here. Something they didn't want anyone to know about. In all directions, huge sand drifts shine in the dark. Among them, the shapes of crippled buildings resemble the remains of a desert city. Ah, another one of these. Scans suggest the creature is eroding the surface beneath below through its cilia, absorbing nutrients from the oxidizing material. The metal walls of this passage are etched with strange spiral patterns. What made these? Some glisten with a thick mucus. The good news is we have a uh, sample. It'll get us more oxygen, at least. And they are spiral secretions. Okay. Thick knots of wires are strung between the angular buildings. Ducts and pipes poke through the pockmarked metal plates. This whole facade, the whole facade of this building has been torn away. The rough shapes of metal furniture and tools lie in the sand. Another bit of information here. User E. Harrison. Deep retrieval needs more repairs. They need to stop pushing so hard. The artificers aren't going anywhere. The distinct shape of a metal desk lies half buried, its surface blurred by a thick coating of silt. The metal walls are buckled by pressure and corrosion, leaving a large wound in this side of the compartment. And the angular shapes of heavy machinery are everywhere, their delicate parts fused by corrosion into complex, thick-veined patterns. There's another one. H. Albright. Say again, Constantine did what? Jesus Christ. Harrison, Site 2 is breached. Power is spiking. This entire corner of the room is piled with tons of rock and sand, leading to a gaping hole in the arcology ceiling above. Seems we can't go higher.
The lines of fabricators and machines suggest this was some sort of machine room for the repair and maintenance of the arcology. Loose wires hanging across the doorway are clumped with fragile lumps of silt like tumorous growths. An automated transport sled, loaded and crushed st loaded with crushed storage cases, juts unevenly out of the sand. Passage to the northwestern part of the arcology is blocked with by a huge rock slide with boulders strewn across the concourse. We have a way through over here. Oh! Wait, didn't we read this? We did. An alleyway cuts between piles of sand and loose rocks, sealed up with a security iris after the breach. Here's something. Site 2 is silent and there's nothing from the Ophelos. Site 1 is off the grid. Where are the rescue teams? Bent at a sharp angle, the wall here is coming away from the floor, leaving a sharp-edged opening into the room behind. And yet despite that, we're starting to run out of power. The tables, the discorded rows of chairs. This had to be where they ate, where they spoke. How many lived here? Chairs lie in disarray. What happened here? Was it sudden or a slow creeping realization that everything was about to end? The polyp's flesh recoils at the barest hint of pressure, but no further movement or response occurs. Sand slopes down over the tables and chairs from a breach in the wall. It's hard not to imagine witnessing the breach. K. Mikami. Disobedience will be reported. Consider your next action carefully. Damn it, Koji, we are dead and buried here. Nothing from the Ophelos. Their feed just cut out. We are being erased here. Baikal is pulling the plug. G. Volkova. The Ophelos is going down? God damn it, what are they doing to my ship? We are leaving. Now. A pair of work boots lie quietly in the corner, overflowing with silt. With everything going on... We've explored a lot, but I think we need to get out of here. Can we actually call a re- call a... No. We can't. Okay. New plan. Activate a boost. We're rushing out of here as quickly as we can so that we can get more, uh... More power and oxygen. Then we'll come back down and investigate some more. We have a lot of information to gather here, I think. And I'm probably going to have to end this episode in the middle of this. Unfortunate! I'm sure this would be great as a full episode. Unfortunately, I had to start in the middle because the last because this one it was halfway through. Okay, we're no longer losing oxygen. Activate this. Rush back. And right here we can regain uh, power and oxygen. Wonderful. And here I'm going to end this episode. Not the stream, just the episode. Next episode, we are going to uh, figure this whole thing out or at least explore more of this place and see what we can learn. That'll be in the next episode. So, until then, I am Chester44, also known as Fly. This has been a Let's Play of, uh... Words. <laughs> in Other Waters. 
and I shall see you all next time.